Yeah. What happened to the speaker, the mic you had? Um, well, not using that one because yeah. that was for Hangouts, but we can't use Hangouts uh, anymore. Yeah. And then um, copy URL. Yeah. And set blue price in the group. Yeah. Copy blue. I was wondering if it was too old. Bruh. Maybe too well. Sorry. Oh, sorry. I'm just trying on. Oh, do you present to those? Yeah. They should be. Oh. Is, there a, is it just like. Oh, there's just a it's duplicating the screen. Maybe if you extend the screen, maybe. Maybe that would work. I think so. Yeah. Um. Oh, wait. No, that's stopped there. It's coming up there. I think if we do. Right, click. Yeah, maybe. Or maybe second screen only. Wait, try presenting yeah, normally. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Are we starting back at quarter past? Or um, just we will start ready? as soon as we're ready, so right, it's going to be a couple minutes. minutes. What time do you think I should just finish my 12? Yeah? Uh, don't have to finish by 12, go a tiny bit over 12. Um, that's fine. Yeah, it's yeah. just a couple of reminders. We're one from the same brand. Oh, so after you after you post it, after you post it, so this will run out after forty minutes because of like what Maddie said. So click share. Then it's working. Um, just click more and make sure it says pause and stop because that means it's already recording. Okay. And then after that, like just. Do that. All right. So once it's over, just come back down. I'll be here until like what, 11.45 this? Yeah. So, yeah, I'm just gonna leave at 11.45 to get- Do you have people to, to, to help? Uh, I'll yeah, message you if I need it, but I might be able to just bring it myself. Are you sure? We'll see, we'll see. Because if they give- hundred if, they, if it's plastic bags, I'll be fine. They give you parking tools. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. So, um, yeah. We'll see, man. I reckon Carrie's someone else would be. I'll, yeah. I'll give you a message, a new message, depending on how much. Yeah, but don't name me here. Though. Um, I'll send you a message. And you can just go. Alright, uh, busy. No stress. But we should be fine, otherwise. Cool. Okay, just one on one on this and one on this as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's fine. Awesome. Thanks, man. Cool. No stress. We're we'll good to go whenever you're ready. Sure. Yeah. I think I'm good. Right. <laughs> Um, hey guys, we'll probably make a start if that's okay, just because you're running a bit late. Um, so I think um, we're meant to finish by 12, so I'll try my best to get the slides done by 12. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, my name is Abhishek, I'm one of the fourth years based at Frankston this year, and I'll just be covering hepatobiliary. So um, in terms of what we're going to be doing today, we'll cover quite a few clinical conditions and a little bit of PAP as well. Um, there's quite a few conditions to go through, so um, most of the notes are on the slide. So today's session will just be focusing on what's really important for you to focus on for your exams and OSCEs. We'll go through some clinical presentations that are OSCE focused as well. And lastly, we'll just go through a few EMQs. Um, so in terms of our EMQ breakdown last year, I'm not sure if you guys have had the chance to have a look at them. Um, hepatobiliary is a fairly large chunk and it often sort of comes into the surgical bits as well. So um, at least about 15% of our exam was on um, like liver and biliary tree stuff. So it is a quite high yield topic to know. And um, I've got some Kit Kats as well, since I think we all need sugar rushes. So there's four questions. Um, I, it's a bit hard for me to like figure out where the sound's coming from, but if you guys just want to raise your hands and have a crack, like, yeah, there's a Kit Kat online. So yeah. Okay, awesome. Um, just a couple of quick disclaimers. Um, the presentation is definitely not meant to be a comprehensive textbook, but rather just a high yield summary of everything that I think was, I would have liked to have known last year. Um, particularly for EMQs, there's a lot of weird options that we've never really seen in clinical settings like Krigler, Najjar, Gilbert, um, like Rota syndrome and all of those. And I think it's good to have a little bit of an understanding on them. That being said though, hopefully the majority of your learning by this stage of the year has been done in like hospitals and just listening to senior students give you presentations and all of that. Um, I've tried to make both the investigations and the management parts as OSCE focused as possible. So hopefully you can find them useful when you're preparing for those. And if you have any questions, just feel free to like stop me halfway through the presentation or just shoot me a message as well later on. Awesome. Okay, so any questions with any of that? Cool. Okay, question one. Okay, I heard of viral hepatitis, I could, oh, awesome, yeah, so, perfect, there you go. <laughs> so this one's viral hepatitis, and, um, 
yeah, I think for, there's three more questions, but if you guys could just raise your hands, then I'd just be fed everyone, that'd be great. <laughs> okay, but um, perfect. So this one's viral hepatitis, and um, it's mainly a process of elimination. So you've got a 28-year-old, so someone who's not young, like too old, and he's feeling nauseated and tired. So it's sort of like an acute presentation, but he does have a past history of IV drug use and alcohol use, two things that are detrimental to the liver. On examination, he does have signs of active jaundice, so you can start, start to rule out things from there, and then based on the process of elimination, you end up with viral hepatitis. Okay, so in terms of summarizing viral hepatitis, I'm sure you guys are aware there's five different types of hepatitis now. Uh, the big ones that you really need to know about are A, B, and C, but D and E are just there for completeness sake. So in terms of what viruses cause them, A, B, C, D, and E are all caused by viruses. The only difference is B is caused by a DNA virus, and the others are caused by RNA viruses. This is something they like to test in PATH. Um, so hepatitis A is not associated with chronic liver disease, and the mode of transmission is primarily fecal-oral. So we often see that in consuming uncooked um, seafoods, things like just being exposed to um, uh, improper hygiene scenarios, and et, et cetera. Um, hepatitis B is the most common liver infection in the world. So um, uh, that's the one caused by uh, the DNA virus. Uh, hep C is an RNA virus as well, and this is the one commonly associated with cancer, so it is very important to know. Uh, sorry, commonly associated with um, chronic, hep, uh, chronic liver disease. Hep D is a one that often occurs in combination with Hep B, and therefore that's the one that's serotic and can cause long-term cancer. And finally, Hep B is just like a sort of exotic one that's associated with pigs and increased mortality during pregnancy. Um, not really too important to know, just here for completeness sake. The take-home message from this slide is hepatitis is not, um, viral hepatitis can be caused by other viruses as well. So the common ones include EBV, CMV, and um, things like yellow fever as well. So it is important to know that other viruses can affect the liver. So let's just quickly go through hepatitis A. Um, so what is it? It's an RNA viral infection, as we said, primarily spread through the fecal oral route. And um, often this occurs with the ingestion of contaminated seafood. A uh, question that we got in our PATH exam last year was the incubation period of hep A, B, C, and D. So um, it is good to know that. So hep A typically is around a month. So we're looking at around 28 days. I think from memory, hep B is like four to six weeks or something like that. So it is good to know those time frames. In terms of epi, um, all of these are communicable diseases, therefore they're commonly seen in developing countries. So it's very endemic in Africa and South America. And as a result, a lot of people who travel there tend to get the disease as well. And that's just a quick map. Um, for your OSCEs, it is good to know a little bit of like a spiel as you sort of explain to your patients what the condition is. So um, you can talk about what its prevalence is in the world as well as its prevalence in Australia. So within Australia, there's only about three to 500 cases a year. It's very, like it's something that's not too common just because we're a more developed country and it's a downward trend as well. So I think it's just good to have that in the back of your head. So in terms of pathophys, this is just a brief one. So the virus is transported through your mesenteric veins to the liver. And so it pretty much goes through the vascular system and that's how it affects your liver. Um, risk factors include um, living with an endemic region. So if you're like in, 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 an, in, uh, an inhabitant of like Africa or South America or any places like that, close personal contact with infected individuals and MSM as well. So um, sexual contact is a big, a big risk factor for, hep for hepatitis A. Um, weak risk factors include um, illicit drug use. Um, clinical presentations, so you expect the common liver disease presentations here, so things like fever, malaise, anorexia, nausea, and arthalgia. Um, the important thing to take away from here is that one week after the patients clinically become jaundiced, they're considered non-infectious, so the disease is unable to be spread to other people by that point. And in terms of transmission, it's important to note that insects and other animal vectors can't really spread the disease, it's just humans spreading it from one person to another. Okay. So what's very important for hepatitis A, B, and C is the serological markers. That's something Monash likes to test quite a lot, and it's very important in terms of clinical um, reasoning as well. So there's three different markers for hep A. You have fecal HAV, you have IgM, and you have IgG. And by far and wide, the most important is IgM. So IgM has a detection time of about four to 12 weeks, which is how long it takes for that to be present in our serum um, concentration. And it's the test of choice for diagnosis. So before you start to develop symptoms, such as jaundice and your arthalgia, you start to see changes in your IgM, which is why it's really good for predicting um, your mortality outcomes. In terms of IgG versus IgM, it's very important to remember that IgM is the acute marker and IgG is the one that's present for life. So this is very important in our Hep B ones, which we'll go through in a little bit. Um, other investigations you can sort of consider when you, when you suspect someone has hepatitis A is your prothrombin time. So you want to check if the liver is producing um, clotting factors appropriately. Your blood urea levels, so just check if um, your metabolism is working well. And lastly, your hep A virus RNA detection, which is um, a very sort of expensive and a new test, and it's not something we commonly use as doctors. 
In terms of prevention, this is more of a year four slide, but I do think it's very nice to pepper in in your OSCEs just because it's something that is good to like mention, especially if the patient asks questions about how to prevent them getting the disease in the future. So you can have, there are immunizations available for hepatitis A and it's an intramuscular injection. Um, so most of us before we started med school would have gotten this immunization at some point in our lives and we can get booster shots as well. So within Australia, the vaccination is recommended for everybody. And literally the only contraindication to the vaccination is if you have an anaphylactic reaction to the vaccination. So there should virtually be no reason for you to not get the shot. You have to get the shot if you can. Um, it's typically not recommended for pregnant and breastfeeding women. But that being said, if, it's very rare that you will get an OSCE at this at third year level. But if you, you, you would still say that I would prefer to give them the shot if possible. And in terms of management, if you do have hepatitis A, unfortunately, there's no medical treatment. And since it is a viral illness, the only thing you can do is just give them supportive care. So you just help them go through the illness, like self-resolve without too many complications. And if they do have acute decompensated liver failure, you might consider a liver transplant in that case. Awesome. Any questions about hepatitis A at all? Hopefully a condition you guys would have seen at least at some point in your hospitals. Okay, question two. Bit of a long question. Okay, I've got a C from somewhere. Sorry, could we see that? Okay, yep. Yeah. Um, anyone else? Okay, we've got an F as well. Okay, um, so the answer here is F in this case. Sorry, that was my bad. <laughs> Okay, um, so let's go through this. So um, this is actually a fourth year question, but I think it's a very fair question that could come up in third year, especially because um, you guys would have done hepatitis B serologies by now. So the important bits are all in the last part of the um, question here, where the hepatitis serology results are. So hep A is IgM negative. So as we said earlier, IgM is the acute marker. And if that's negative, it means that he doesn't have a current hepatitis A infection. Yep, awesome. Um, Anti-HAV IgG positive, that means he's had hep A at some point in his life, and we don't really know if that's a result of him having had it in the past as immunization or if he's actually had the infection. And for the purpose of this question, let's just assume it could be either or. The important bit is his hepatitis B serum antigen is negative. Now, that's the very important marker that we look for to, to determine if they have a current infection or not. Um, so based on this, he doesn't have a current infection, so that could sort of rule out most of the options. So that rules out that, that, and that. And um, it rules out that as well and that, okay? So we're just left with these, three, uh, these five options here. The fact that he has anti-HBS positive means that he would have had some form of the hepatitis B infection or immunization at some point in their lives. And the only way we can predict whether or not it's an immunization or an infection is if we have the core antigen details there as well, which I've blacked out in this question. Therefore, we can't really predict what he's had there. And that's why F is the best answer, just because it covers all bases with immunization or infection. Okay. Um, any questions with that? I've got a nice table um, in a couple of slides, but I think it's very important to know your hepatitis B serologies in the back of your head. Okay, so in terms of what hep B is, it's a DNA infection, as we said. And in terms of its incubation period, it's one to six months. Sorry, so not four to six weeks, it's four weeks to 24 weeks. And this was a question we had in our um, GIT path exam. Um, epi, again, like hep A, it's a very common condition in developing countries, mainly seen in Africa and um, uh, Southeast Asia. Um, and, and it causes over a million deaths a year. So unfortunately, it's a very sort of um, high mortality condition. Within Australia, unlike Hep A, a lot of people do have Hep B. So um, just uh, just remember it now. Like I think Hep A had like a very sort of recent media thing a couple of years ago with the berry spread. So Australia was importing berries from like Asia, and there was like a rapid increase in acute Hep A. So um, that's another thing to consider as well. So within um, Australia, Hep B is fairly common. There's a, over like 200,000 people with it, and unfortunately, a third of those population have not been diagnosed yet. So that's something quite important. Um, hep B is able to cause hepatocellular carcinoma without cirrhosis. So this is the one that's actually a carcinogenic virus. And the only way it does that is if it integrates with Hep D as well. So that's something quite important to know. And it's responsible for 40% of all of the hep, um, hepatic cancers. So in terms of classification, the way I learned Hep B was you could divide it into acute or chronic Hep B. 
So um, acute hep B is the first six months of infection and chronic hep B is pretty much anything after six months. And if you do have chronic hep B, chances are you consider to have hep B for the rest of your life. And 25% of those people unfortunately pass away from liver failure or liver cancer. So this is something that wasn't really taught to me at least, and it's something that I learned from student slides, but there's four phases of chronic hep B. So um, not everyone with hep B will go through the four phases, but all carriers will have a positive HBSAG, so the surface antigen. So I'll just quickly go through the four phases now. You have immune tolerance, immune clearance, immune control, and finally something called immune escape. And the names of these are not that important to know. What is important to know is the status of something called HBEAG. Now, HPEAG is something that we don't routinely test for in, in a blood test. So if you suspect someone has hepatitis B and you order like a hepatitis panel, it won't include HPEAG. But that being said, that's what separates the four phases of hepatitis B. So um, it's positive in the tolerance and the clearance stages, and it's negative in the control and the escape stages. And the purpose of having this, these four phases is just to see the viral load of hepatitis B DNA in your blood. That's literally all it's good for. So it's not something that will really be asked in your EMQ exam, but it's something that's very nice to pepper into your OSCEs and be like, if someone has chronic hepatitis B, something I would like to assess is what phase of infection they're in, just because I can sort of assess their viral load from there as well. It's something that the faculty would really sort of be like, oh, they're thinking the right way. Okay, so in terms of risk factors for progressing through these actual phases, what's very important to consider is not addressing um, sort of things that can worsen the actual hepatitis. So if you do have chronic hepatitis B and you still continue to consume high amounts of alcohol or you still engage in like risky behavior like IV drug use and all of that, chances are you're probably gonna continue to worsen. So um, things like um, ETOH, if you have concurrent HIV and if you're older at diagnosis. Um, other risk factors include IV drug use, MSM and vertical transmission, so mom to bub as well as a family history of um, hepatic cancer. Um, in terms of clinical presentation, it's very, very similar to hepatitis A, and the only difference is joint pain and hives, so urticaria, are commoner compared to hep A, so that's something you just happen to see more in hep B. Okay, so this is where the money is for hep B, in my opinion, at least from an EMQ perspective. So like hep B, there are three markers we use for in determining the um, infective, state, infective status of someone with hep B. That's surface antigen, surface antibody, and core antibody. So the surface antigen is by far the most important one because that determines whether someone or not is actively infectious. So if that's positive, you know for a fact they have the disease. If that's negative, you know for a fact that they currently don't have the disease. So always start with looking at that. Um, and once you do look at that, that's when you go and start assessing surface antibody and core antibody. So in terms of just looking at what, it, um, what the serology interpretation is, I think it's good to have a table format for this. So um, let's just start with the um, fourth one from here. So we start with looking at HBSAG. And in this case, HBSAG is positive. So we know for a fact that they have some form of infection, but we don't know whether it's acute or chronic. And the way we determine whether it's acute or chronic is if we look at the IgM. So as we said earlier, IgM is an acute marker. If that's positive, we know that it's a relatively acute infection. If that's negative, but HBSAG is still positive, we know that it's a chronic infection. Yeah? Awesome. Um, after that, we'll look at HBSAG as a negative one. So that's all of these ones here. So if HBSAG is negative, we know for a fact that they're not currently infectious, but we still have to determine whether or not um, they've had a previous infection or they've had like a previous vaccination. And the way we determine that is we start looking at the surface antibody and the core antibody. So if, if the HBSAG is negative, the HBS, so the surface antibody, is almost always likely to be positive if they've had like a previous infection or a previous vaccination. And the way you determine if it's an infection or a vaccination is you look at the core antibody. So um, if they've had a vaccination, they've never been exposed to the actual virus before. They've been exposed to an attenuated form of the virus. Therefore, the core antibody is going to be negative in that case. If they've had the actual infection, they've been exposed to the actual bug. Therefore, the core antibody is going to be positive. Yeah. Stop me if I'm going too quickly here, but this is a very important concept that, you, it, that like, you, I feel like you guys should know for your OSCEs. Okay. And the last one, which is pretty simple, is your HBSAG is negative and your HBS and your HBC is negative. So everything's negative. It means you're not currently infected because your HBSAG is negative. But that being said, you have not been immunized, nor have you had a past infection. Therefore, you're at risk of developing a, current, uh, a future infection. Um, something that Monash likes you to know but hasn't really ever tested us on is inconclusive. So um, that's when your HBSAG is negative. So you don't have a current infection. 
but then for some reason your core antibody is positive. And um, there's several reasons as to why that can happen. The three common ones are dist distant resolved HPV infections. So you have had an infection in the past, but for some reason it's just not showing up correctly. It's a false positive result or there's like passive transfer. And all of these are like very exotic ones that we don't really need to know about in detail. It's just something we need to consider. Okay, awesome. In terms of preventing a um, hepatitis B, again, there's a vaccination and like the hep A vaccination, it's indicated for everybody. And once you do give them the vaccination, you take a repeat of their blood sample and you check how the hepatitis B viral load is there. And that's just what it is. So if the viral load is, um, sorry, if the um, surface antibody load is very high, it means the body's responded well to the vaccination. If it's extremely low, you need to give them another set of vaccinations because clearly the shot hasn't worked. Um, effective vaccinations include Recombivac, so that's something that's good to know. I don't think you need to know the name, just mention that for preventing it, you would give them a vaccination. And in terms of management, again, it's a viral infection, supportive care is a mainstay of treatment. If they have very acute decompensation, consider admission to hospital and a liver transplant. Awesome. Um, so hep C. So again, what is hep C? It's an RNA infection with clinical symptoms developing six to eight weeks after exposure. Again, time frame that's very important to know. Um, like hep A and hep B, it's a fairly common condition. And within Australia, it's as common as hep B. So over 200,000 people have the actual disease with IV drug use being responsible for over 90% of this condition. So, um, um, so in 2011, 80% of all the conditions were, were a result of um, unsafe, injecting, um, unsafe injection of drug, drugs. So early infection of hep C is actually typically asymptomatic with about 85% developing silent infection, which means you do have the serological symptoms of having the virus load increased in your blood, but you don't have any physical symptoms themselves. Um, in terms of pathophys, um, that's just there for completeness sake. All I've written here is the hep C virus doesn't actually kill the liver cells directly, but then eventually the presence of the virus in the body can cause liver inflammation and it's the inflammation that causes the liver to die off. Risk factors, we went through IV drug use quite extensively and other risk factors for hep C developing into chronic cirrhosis is if you're male, if you're older, and if you still continue to drink alcohol once you do have hep C. Um, and by far and wide, it's, it's obvious there that the most common cause of uh, hep C is injection of uh, like drug use. Um, so in terms of symptoms, the big ones that you obviously wanna keep in the back of your head is jaundice, which is um, less commonly seen in acute hep C, but something that, um, that I found in my notes is porphyria cutanea tarda, which is like a sort of um, like red spots developing, particularly on the peripheries of your body. So um, I think that's good to know um, just as part of your learning. Um, diagnosis of hep C is a stepwise process. So firstly, you diagnose them based on the clinical symptoms they have. If you see like an older gentleman who's starting to lose weight, who looks yellow, you want to consider hep C. Um, the disease is suspected based on an elevated um, ALT and AST level. So they should have some degree of transaminitis as well as the presence of anti-HCV antibodies in the serum. So um, that's one of the antibodies that shows that your body is trying to fight against the hepatitis C virus. Um, I'll just skip over this for now, but um, I've got a couple of slides in a little bit about LFTs. And I think LFTs are something that are very important to know because most of us know about like AST, ALT, GGT, and ALP. But I think something that's good to know is the ratios of each of these to each other as well. So I'll cover that in a, in a few slides. Um, once you do have step one done, diagnosis is only co confirmed through the, detect through the detection of HCV RNA. So this is a PCR technique that's quite expensive. So um, not something commonly done in hospitals, but something that I feel you should definitely mention in your OSCEs. Um, in terms of treatment, again, vaccinations for the other hepatitis, so, so like hepatitis A and hepatitis B, if they've already not been vaccinated. And there are several treatment options for hepatitis C. And this is actually a very new thing that hasn't really come up in contemporary medicine yet. So fun fact, one of the treatments for hepatitis C was apparently a really good treatment, but a side effect they found was it treated the hepatitis C, but ended up giving you hepatitis B. And people were like, oh, okay, that's not really a good thing. So um, they stopped using that, but um, these are just the treatments there. Um, you definitely don't need to know any of these treatments because they're not on e-pharmacology. But I think the important thing to know is if you suspect someone has hepatitis C, all of these are antiviral. So just be like, I would start them on antiviral therapy. Um, prognosis of hepatitis C, unfortunately, it's the worst of A, B, and C, with 80% of acute cases becoming chronic and 20% of those becoming cirrhotic. 
Um, one question that sort of came up, I think, in the 2010 or 2011 paper was the association of hepatitis C with a renal complication. So hepatitis C can actually cause a type of glomerular nephritis, and it's actually membrane proliferative GN. Um, there's no particular reason as to why it's membrane proliferative over the other types of GN. It just happens to be associated with hepatitis C. And I couldn't really find any other information on this apart from like one case study in like Europe. So yeah, um, just know that if you do get that question and it's like a renal complication, it's membrane proliferative. Okay, that's everything to do with hepatitis, at least the viral bits. Any questions about any of that? Awesome. Okay. Um, another thing that's very important to know at the 30 level is autoimmune hepatitis. So in terms of classifying them, there are four different kinds of autoimmune hep. Um, the big ones are type 1 and type 2. Type 1 is the classic form characterized by a positive ANA. Type 2 is positive LKM. So I think, um, I can't remember what LKM stands for, but it's like liver, kidney, something. So um, that's, that's, that's how you diagnose type 1 or type 2. Um, type 1 is classically seen in older females. Type 2 is classically seen in female children. Um, type 3 and type 4, I've just done there for like completeness sake, not very important to know at a medical student level, not very important to know at like a junior doctor level either. It's more of like a consultancy thing. Um, in terms of epi, type 1 um, AIH has a bimodal age distribution, which means that it affects people who are relatively young, so between 10 to 30, or people who are like quite old, between 40 to 60. For all four types, like pretty much every autoimmune disease, women are more commonly affected compared to men. And in terms of etiology, given that it's an autoimmune condition, it's just genetic predisposition. Some, some um, ethnicities or races are more predisposed to developing this condition than others. And like things like, so when you guys do an OSCE station on Crohn's disease, for example, if the question they ask you is what's the cause of Crohn's disease, there isn't really a known cause apart from genetics. But one thing that I think would be what sort of separate you from the rest of the cohort is you say that there are environmental triggers that could cause the disease. So on um, things like stress, for instance, if you have a genetic susceptibility to developing Crohn's, but then you have particular aspects of your life, like a stressful time in your life, that could sort of exacerbate the genetic risk and make you more likely to develop symptoms. Yeah. So um, that's very similar to autoimmune hepatitis as well. You might have a genetic predisposition to developing the actual condition, but things like getting a measles virus infection on top of that might just make you more likely to show symptoms of autoimmune hepatitis. I think that's quite important to know. Um, so the ones I have here are measles virus. Um, dihy dihydrolazine is a very important one. So that's an antihypertensive drug that's commonly associated with lupus as well. So that's something that's been tested in third year level before. And black cohosh is like a contemporary, like what is it, um, alternative medicine thing. That's yeah. Um, in terms of associations, it's an autoimmune condition. Therefore, it's going to be associated with everything autoimmune. So type 1 is associated with thyroid disease and ulcerative colitis. Type 2 is associated with type 1 diabetes. That's the two main things that I think would be important. To know. Um, clinical presentation, like all types of hepatitis, you get hepatomegaly and jaundice. Um, you can also get other like sort of cardinal symptoms like fatigue, malaise, anorexia, abdo discomfort, cirrhosis, and you can get kidney involvement as well. Um, since autoimmune diseases, as we said, most commonly occur in females, a common presentation you can get is the absence of regular menstrual cycles. Um, in terms of extrahepatic manifestations, you can get sicca, Raynaud's, thyroiditis, Sjogren's, and arthalgias. Does anyone know what sicca is? Uh, yeah, so sicca refers to just dryness. So um, in this, it can refer to dryness in the eyes, but um, it's just dryness anywhere. So Sjogren's, for instance, is sicca in the eyes and the mouth. Um, and all of these conditions are autoimmune conditions. So it's pretty much associated with anything that's autoimmune. Um, investigations, you want to do a full set of LFTs and then all your LFTs are going to be raised because there's active inflammation of the liver and your IgG might be increased as well. Um, the important things to remember are your exotic antibodies for this. So type one, as we said, is asthma positive and ANA positive. Type two is asthma and ANA negative, but you're going to have your LKM positive. Um, treatment, autoimmune condition, unfortunately nothing you can really do about it apart from blast them with steroids. And you can also give them azathioprine, which is one of your rheumatoid drugs. Um, if they aren't responding to steroids or they have severe contraindications, that's when you consider a liver transplant. Okay, awesome. Um, so moving on to chronic liver disease. Question three. Kick cats on the line, guys. Uh, I heard an F, but where from? Sorry. Okay. Uh, there's one more question. Try to raise your hands, guys, if possible. It, yep, it's F. Perfect. Oh, that was a bad throw. Sorry. Okay. Perfect. So it is F here. Um, so things that point to a fatty liver picture in this case, um, 
He is BMI is 36, so he's clearly obese. He has type 2 diabetes, which means he's clearly had some sign of metabolic syndrome in the past. He has hypothyroidism, which again points to an increased weight picture. He has, he has bilateral knee osteoarthritis, therefore he's obese and he's causing stress on his knees. And he has um, liver derangement consistent with like sort of an obesity sort of picture. So everything here points to something that's a result of metabolic syndrome rather than something caused by um, like hepatitis or Wilson's disease or anything like that. Um, one thing that could be a valid answer is alcoholic liver disease. The only reason why that's not a good answer in this case is there's been no information about his alcohol intake provided. And it's, not, it's very presumptuous of us to assume that he drinks alcohol as well. Okay, so hopefully you guys would have come across a similar mnemonic at some point this year. The mnemonic I use for remembering causes of chronic liver disease is hand wave, which is hemochromatosis, autoimmune, fat, fatty liver disease, just any drugs in general, but typically paracetamol. Wilson's alpha-1 viral causes and alcohol. And I think it's very important to know this on the back of your mind because if they ask, like a common thing they do in third-year OSCEs is at the end of your examination of history, the examiner might ask you some questions. And this is a very sort of fair question they can ask you. Like what are some other causes of chronic liver disease? Okay, so by far and wide, the biggest one you need to know about is alcoholic liver disease. Um, there are three types of alcoholic liver disease. So the first one is fatty liver, which every alcoholic has. And the important thing to associate with this is this is reversible. So your, so your liver might be fatty at some point, but if you seize your alcohol consumption or reduce it, this, this, pathophysio this pathology can be reversed. You have alcoholic hepatitis, which is sometimes reversible. And finally, you end up with cirrhosis, which is, all, like, which is most likely irreversible. So potentially irreversible here, but it's like pretty much irreversible. Um, epi, 3.3 million deaths are caused as a result of alcoholic liver disease. And why, is this, why does this occur? Because of chronic alcohol ingestion. So what chronic alcohol ingestion is defined as 40 to 80 grams of, uh, per day in men and 20 to 40 in women for greater than 10 years. So um, things like your standard drinks. So how many grams of alcohol are present in one standard drink? Okay, well, I've, I've heard 10 and 12.5. Both of you are technically right. I think Toronto notes says 12.5 uh, 12 because that's a Canadian guideline and Australia says 10. So it's like one's Canadian, one's um, Australian. So just double check on that. Um, in terms of pathophys, just a brief um, revision of like first year stuff here. Alcohol is metabolized through either alcohol dehydrogenase or CYP450. And chronic um, alcohol exposure causes um, hepatic macrophages to be involved as well. So the presence of these macrophages being activated causes liver damage. So there's three changes we see in terms of like a patho pathology picture with alcoholic liver disease. Firstly, you get death of your hepatic cells. You get something called Mallory bodies, which is buzz buzz, very important Monash buzzword. And lastly, you get chicken wire fibrosis. So all three of these occur um, together in alcoholic hepatitis. And it's also important to remember that since alcohol is very rich in carbohydrates, you start getting fat globules being present as well. So you get generalized steatosis. Um, in terms of complications, the obvious one is you get like cirrhosis and then cirrhosis can result in portal hypertension. Portal hypertension can result in bleeding. Bleeding can result in like vomiting, loss of blood, you die. So complication, death. Um, you get a high risk of hepatic encephalopathy as well. And this is uh, just a thing I included here for the natural history of, um, uh, sorry, sorry, Manoj. Uh, I've got like a message from Zoom here. The, <laughs> it says a meeting will end in 10 minutes. Fix that, yeah. Okay, um, so I'll just quickly carry on. So in terms of clinical presentation, um, from a primary care standpoint, so if this is someone you're seeing without any obvious symptoms, um, you might just get high blood pressure. You won't really get anything else. And um, upon palpation, you might feel hepatomegaly. So what's really important to differentiate here is initial stages of alcoholic liver disease, your liver becomes big. Chronic stages of alcoholic liver disease, your liver becomes cirrhotic or it becomes smaller. That's quite important to differentiate between. Um, late stage, you start getting cardinal um, symptoms of liver disease. So um, I think the way we were taught at Dandenong where I was last year was there are seven signs of liver disease. You get easy bruising, leukonychia, clubbing, palmar erythema, spider nevi, the development of breasts, and testicular atrophy. So pretty much anything that makes your estrogen levels go up, as well as causes liver failure, causing clotting damage, causing the bleed. Um, signs specific to chronic alcoholism include Dupuytren's contractures, so the little um, flexure contraction that you get on your palms, um, enlargement of your parotids, and proximal myopathy. Um, does anyone know why you get proximal myopathy as a result of alcoholism? Sorry? 
Perfect. So um, if, if you do have alcoholism, chances are you're probably not eating anything else as well. So B12 deficiency is a very common side effect and you do get proximal myopathy as a result of B12 deficiency. Um, other features, you get splenomegaly because of portal hypertension and your pancreas gets shot as well. So um, causes of pancreatitis, um, I get smashed. Alcoholism is one of them. Okay. Um, in terms of investigations, very, very, very osceable. Okay, so you want to do bloods. So um, alcoholism is a common cause of anemia, in particular macrocytic anemia, and you can also get generalized inflammation as well. You want to do LFTs and you want to do electrolytes just to check that the electrolytes are not markedly deranged. Uh, something that's very nice to throw in is um, your coagulation cascade. So things like PT, APTT, and INR, and that's good for measuring liver function. In terms of imaging, the very, very big thing that Monash is involved in is something called a fibro scan. So a fibro scan is something that actually only came up like 25 years ago, but it's a very sort of detailed 3D imaging of the liver. And um, if you do throw that in, like the examiner will genuinely be quite impressed. So um, instead of mentioning like a liver ultrasound, say a liver fibro scan that like really shows like, you're like oh, I've attended hospital all year. Um, a fibro scan is really good for determining whether or not the cirrhosis has developed into cancer as well. So it's something that we do long term. Um, management, make them stop drinking if possible. So this includes things like counseling, starting them on medications to like prevent, they, prevent them wanting alcohol and things like that. So the ones I have here are Alcoholics Anonymous and um, disulfiram is something I think you guys might have heard of in third year. I'm not sure, but um, pretty much what that is, is it's a, med it's a tablet medication that you give people. And once they drink alcohol when they're on that medication, they just get like, they pretty much get allergic to the alcohol. Like they want to throw up and they just want to avoid alcohol. It causes like a toxic reaction to the alcohol itself. Um, other drugs are naltrexone and acamprosate, not that important to know in third year, but good for fourth year. Thiamine is very important for third year. So thiamine is something that we give to replenish their vitamins. The important thing to remember is if someone comes in with acute alcoholism, give them as much thiamine as possible. Thiamine is not toxic. It's not going to cause any symptoms to them. But if you don't give it to them, they have, they're at a risk of like rapidly deteriorating. In um, terms of acute management of alcohol withdrawal, this is a very uh, fair station that you might get as like an emergency presentation. So withdrawal starts about 10 to three days, uh, 10 hours to three days after the last drink. And symptoms include just like being sort of restless, you get confused, you might get seizures. The big one is something called delirium tremens. So a very common thing you get about three days after your last drink is you just get extremely worked up and restless and agitated. You get a symptom called formication. Does anyone know what that is? So formication is the sensation of having insects crawling up your hands. Um, be slightly careful how you pronounce this word. Don't say fornication. That means something completely different. But formication is a common side effect of delirium, uh, is a common side effect of alcohol withdrawal. Um, acute management, you don't give them any of these disulfur and naltrexone and acamprosate because you've got a person who's like very agitated. Chances are they're like quite well built as well. You give them diazepam, which is like a short acting benzodiazepine that'll just knock them out. Once you give them diazepam or lorazepam, that's when you start considering the other drugs. And these are just some of the features of um, alcohol withdrawal. Okay, awesome. Um, Non-alcoholic liver disease. Most common cause of chronic liver disease in the Western world, and it's seen in about 30% of all people. Um, and it's projected to be a leading indication for liver transplantation after superseding hep C. Fun fact. Okay, so how does, how does this disease occur? So pretty much in older patients who have had like bad or crappy diets throughout their lives, their insulin levels in their body are still being produced, but the body is just becoming more and more resistant to insulin itself. As a result of the body becoming re um, resistant to insulin, they start accumulating fats. And where do these fats accumulate? They accumulate in the liver. And therefore, the liver starts getting damaged. In terms of classification, there are four different types. You have simple steatosis, which is not too bad. Like probably most of us have simple steatosis at this point in our lives. Um, you have steatosis plus inflammation, which is things are getting pretty bad. But again, like if you sort of address your diet, it's not going to be a big problem. You have steatosis plus inflammation plus degeneration. Okay, things are starting to get pretty damn bad now, which is called NASH without fibrosis. And finally, you have NASH with fibrosis. So um, NASH is non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. And it's type four that can result in cancer. So um, the aim is you don't want them to get to type four. If they do get to type four, then you're like, oh shit. And then you start like treating them like well. Okay, risk factors, metabolic syndrome. So if you have cardiovascular disease, if you have diabetes, if you have high amount of fats in your blood, that's a big thing. One thing that I've included here that isn't typically part of metabolic syndrome is um, parental nutrition. So um, I'm sure you guys might have heard of parental nutrition at some point in hospital. So parental nutrition is a thing that's given to pretty much bypass 
the gastric system. So you're pretty much giving them food through the veins. Now, this is good for like a very sort of acute sort of thing. Like if you can give, you can give it to them for up to a week, but if you continue giving that long term, they start developing fat accumulation everywhere and that pretty much mimics metabolic syndrome. Um, clinical presentation, again, they just get vague upper quadrant pain. There's, there isn't really anything else about it. And when you do um, like a series of blood tests on them, their LFTs are just off the charts. Treatment, you aim to control risk factors, encourage a healthy diet. Bariatric surgery, if they're morbidly obese, is a very good treatment option as well. And follow-up, you just continue monitoring them. So if, if this is like, if you're in hospital, you'd be like, I'd get the patient to follow up with their GP every six months. And I'd also like to do regular scans of the liver just to check that they've not progressed to liver cancer. Okay. Um, any questions about any of that? Awesome. Hopefully this is like fairly familiar content to you guys and nothing too new. But um, let, me, like, let me know if there's anything that's like a bit confusing. Okay, this is very, very important for third year because it very rarely comes up in fourth year, but I think it's quite important to know for your third year exams. So cirrhosis, what is cirrhosis? It's pretty much liver damage characterized by distortion of the liver anatomy. And the, this liver anatomy is then eventually replaced with scar tissue. 